Thank you for listening in. My name is Maarten Grotendorst. I am a clinical data scientist at IKNL, uh, which is an organization aimed to reduce the impact of cancer. Uh, outside of IKNL, I am mostly known for my open source work, uh, things like Keybird, Polyfast, Concept. But during this talk, I will be mostly speaking about their topic. And their topic is topic modeling, where we combine old known methods with more new state-of-the-art methods that we see, how, see more popular in the last few years. So what is Bird Topic? Well, Bird Topic is a topic modeling technique and it aims to create dense clusters of documents that are semantically similar to each other. And from these clusters, we try to extract the topic descriptions. And using that, we want to model topics and see what we can find in the data. The repository, you can find a link on the top and installation is rather straightforward. It's just a pip install Bird Topic. The usage of your topic is also something you have seen more often. Uh, we load in some data, in this case, the 20 news groups data set. Uh, there are a bunch of articles uh, across 20 categories. And we instantiate your topic, we do a fit transform, and then we have a bunch of topics. But the question here is what are the topics and why are they interesting for our use cases? Well, after we have trained our topic model, we can just run get topic info. And what you see is something that we see typically with topic modeling techniques like LDA. We have a topic, for example, topic one, and it constitutes of certain important words like Jesus, Bible, Christian faith. And these important words best describe the topic or cluster that we have found. Now, the thing is, if we see these words, uh, there's still some interpretation needed, right? I see Jesus, Bible, Christian faith, but that's not really a, a topic, that's not really a name, it's a description of that. And as a result, me, the user, or you, has to interpret what those words are really about. And, and if I read it correctly, for me, that seems like it's about religion. In the same vein, if we look at topic two, I see words such as space, lunar, orbit, launch. And together, these, I think, might be about space travel. Now, I'm saying I think quite frequently because it's subjective. Uh, what I think is a topic, uh, you might not agree with me. And as such, this entire topic modeling field can get rather subjective because we might not agree about certain topics, uh, about their um, level of hierarchy, whether they should be more specific or more abstract. And as a result, which topic modeling technique am I then going to be using? I'm going to be using LDA, in this case, per topic, or something entirely different. Now, there are several advantages of using per topic, and I will go through them here. But before we can go into those advantages, it might be helpful if we go through the algorithm quickly to see how it generally works. And then based on that, we can build on top of it. So per topic, how does it work? Well, we start with a bunch of documents and those documents are all unstructured, textual representation. And to do something meaningful with that, we need to convert it to numerical representations. And seeing as we are doing clustering, it, it helps if those embeddings that we extract, those vectors or features, if they work quite well with uh, semantic similarity. And Sentence Transformer is an amazing model that focuses on that. So in this example, we're using Sentence Transformers. We then reduce the dimensionality of these vectors to something that can be more easily clustered, right? The curse of dimensionality is still an issue. Uh, and if you have vectors that have more than 300 values, clustering becomes a little bit more difficult. So we use, for example, UMAP to do dimensionality reduction. After that, we perform clustering. And here, the UMAP HDB scan combo has been working rather well, and it has been gaining popularity over the last few years, and rightfully so. So we're using that for this purpose. And what we get is we get a bunch of clusters, and in each of those clusters, we have semantically similar documents that should represent a single topic. And well, I refer to the new and the old. This is the new, because, well, we have transformer-based input or embeddings. Uh, we have UMAP and HDB scan, which has been, uh, have shown amazing results over the last few years and do this pipeline rather well, right? The clustering. 
Now, before we do the topic extraction, uh, we first need to think about something because here we're using HDB scan for the clustering. And HDB scan assumes that there's some sort of density involved with these clusters that we have. So a centroid based topping extraction approach might or might not make sense. It kind of depends on the clusters that we have. In the same vein, if we use K means instead of HDB scan, then a centroid based topic extraction approach makes more sense. And we can go through all of these clustering approaches that all work in their own way. Um, which makes it difficult to do these topic extractions. So instead of focusing on a topping extraction approach that makes some sort of assumption with the clustering, let's go back to the basics. Let's do a bag of words representation of these clusters. And instead of focusing on a document level, but we're, we're focusing here, of course, on a clustering level, we want topics, not individual documents. So now we can say, okay, in this specific cluster, we have these tokens and they appear that frequently instead of saying for each single document. And when we have the back of words, we can do something traditional. We can look into TF-IDF. The only thing is, is that, well, it's in the name, IDF is inverse document frequency and we're not so much interested about documents. So instead, let's change it a little bit uh, in order to be more focused on the differences between clusters. What makes one cluster different from all of the other clusters? And if we combine all of this together, we have the new and the old. We have the new, more state-of-the-art, recent methods, but still back of words approaches that work rel relatively well, right? I mean, we have done our semantic separation in clustering, uh, so a back of words representation uh, can be made on top of that. Now, the important thing to note here is that each of these steps are, well, relatively independent from one another. The bag of words approach doesn't really care about the embedding extraction tool that you use. It doesn't care whether you use sentence transformer or whether you use, well, let's say, Jensen, Spacey, one of the many, many hugging face models out there and the important thing about that is because it doesn't make any assumptions on the step that come before, we can just swap out models. We can say, okay, I don't want SBIRT, I don't want UMAP, I don't want HDB scan, let's just change it and swap it out for something entirely different. And that's the first, I think, major advantage of something like BERT topic is its modularity. Because you have certain use cases, you are familiar with certain models, and if you have a certain use case, um, you can essentially say, okay, I want these and these steps with these and these models because they fit with what I'm trying to achieve. So let's take this uh, piece of code, for example, we have a bird topic model and I want to have a center transformer in there. And I want a fast model, that's the all mini LM, um, but also want to have some decent accuracy, which it, it definitely gives. And I'm not familiar with UMAP that much is a difficult method. Uh, PCA, that's a little bit more intuitive to me, so let's use that. And HDB scan, well, generates outliers and that's, that doesn't fit with my data. So I'm gonna use k-means and uh, well, there are 50 topics, I think, in there, so let's do 50. We can define our own vectorizer model and in the same way, our own class DFIDF transformer, where we can also say, okay, I want some VM25 weighting on top of that. What's so important about all of these steps is it gives some control back to the developer. The developer can then say, okay, I want these and these steps because they fit with my use case. I don't want outliers, so I'm using k-means. I want something that's a little bit faster in certain cases, so I'm using PCA. I don't have a GPU, so I'm not going to use sentence transformer. I'm just going to be using TF-IDF representation. And this control is important because Topic modeling is subjective and each use case is different. Now, a second advantage to, well, this relatively straightforward pipeline is that we can do a lot of variations in this topic modeling field. There are a lot of out there. Yeah, there's guided topic modeling, class-based, dynamics, and my supervised, and Oracle. I believe there's online topic modeling and a few more. And the the good thing about variations is that you can do a lot of interesting things with that. The difficulty is, is that you often need 
many different packages installed to do all of these things. And how great would it be if there's a one single package that can do all of these things uh, relatively well? And of course, that's, that's what's implemented in Bird Topic. But the reason why this can be implemented in Bird Topic is that we reduce the topic modeling approach to something relatively straightforward. We're saying, okay, we have a bag of words representation and a CT of IDF representation, and we can just split the data according to, for example, the classes. Uh, if you have those 20 classes in the 20 news groups data set, we can easily see how a trained bird topic model differs for these certain classes. So if we have a, a subject, a topic about space travel, we can then see how people talk about space travel in a certain category, for example, health, which doesn't really fit together, but still we can see how, they, uh, how these things come together. And they're all, or at least class-based dynamic and hierarchical topic modeling are post hoc analyses. So we have our base model. And from that base model, we can say, okay, there's a little bit more information that we want. Uh, I think there's some hierarchy in there because I have way too many topics. So I want to merge them together. You can also say there is some temporal nature in my data because I have tweets and well, the way people talk about cars is different now than it was 20 years ago. Not that Twitter was around 20 years ago, but you get the point. And because we reduce topic modeling to its basics, it becomes rather straightforward to do all of these things inside um, a single topic modeling framework. And hopefully, that gives some power back to the developer and use it wherever, whenever they want. Now, the third thing is visualizations. And that's something that, that I think might be underestimated at times. As I mentioned before, it's about subjectiveness to a certain extent in topic modeling approaches, because what I think is a topic, you don't have to agree with me and vice versa, of course. So there's no ground truth available. It's difficult to say, okay, this topic model has an accuracy of 99%. It's really about when do you use certain topic modeling techniques in which specific use cases, and most importantly, how do your stakeholders, public, whoever is relevant, what do they think about what's being modeled? Because if there's a specific domain, very specific domain knowledge, it really helps if you have a stakeholder look at, for example, these visualizations so that they can get an intuitive feeling of what is happening here. So to give you an example, we have our piece of code, we do PCA, K-means, uh, of course, CTF IDF transformer, and we train our model. And we train our model on those 20 news group data sets. Uh, there are roughly, I think, 18,000 documents split across 20 classes or categories, and we want to see how many topics appear there. And just for the sake of it, let's say 30 topics in there. Even though we know they have been assigned in 20 categories, we can still say, OK, I believe there are way more topics in there. Now, after doing this, we can visualize them, those topic representations, with a very straightforward bar chart. And that helps because you can intuitively see which words are more important, which topics might make sense and which don't. Uh, if we take topics four and five, those seems rather straightforward to me. Four is about religion, topic five, well, let's say sports. But if you go to topic seven, uh, that, that becomes a little bit more difficult to interpret. And that might be due to uh, K-means or PCA or whatever, but something we can play with. So we get the topic representation, that's where it starts. Then we can split it across certain classes. And before we go into the classes, we, well, we said, okay, topic four is about religion, topic five is about sports. So let's assign those labels because it helps us with the interpretation. And if we then visualize the topics for each class, we, we can see religion appears frequently in, let's see, atheism, Christian, politics, religion-based topics. Um, so that makes sense. And if there are certain classes that you see here, I think SciMath is, is some sort of health topic, uh, that might not make sense. And when you see things like that, okay, we can go back to the model and see where it might have been, gone things wrong. We can do the same thing with sports, where we see that it happens quite frequently 
in baseball and in hockey. Makes sense. It's about sports, so that's what we would expect. But I see Simat again in there. So, well, maybe the topic model is wrong. That's that's definitely a possibility. But in the same way, maybe the data is wrong because things are still manually labeled and people make mistakes. We can continue these visualizations with well, many, many more. I'm not going to show you all of them, but to give you general ID, we can do a hierarchy. I have now 30 topics, but what if I say, okay, let's just model 200. I have k-means, I can just say number of clusters is 200, 2000. Um, and then see on a very fine-grained level what possible topics are, but also how they might be merged. Because these 30 topics that might be created, you might think, okay, topic, let's see, 16 and 29 on the top. Those are very similar to each other, so let's, let's merge them. I don't think they are separate topics. I think the clustering needs a little bit of help. So we can merge them ourselves. Similarly, we can say, okay, we have a similarity matrix. We can find topics that are similar to one, one another to a certain extent. And then based on that extent, the similarity score, you can say, okay, again, we're gonna combine these topics or see that these two are very similar to each other, even though they have different representations, um, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is about these advantages is that allows for, for quite a lot of things together. So we have some modularity in here. Uh, we can say, okay, I want to use PCA or, well, if I have a TF-IDF representation, truncated SVD typically works a little bit better than that. I have different forms of data. I have classes, temporal data. So also let's measure some variations. Let's do class-based topic modeling, dynamic topic modeling, uh, soon to be released uh, incremental topic modeling or online topic modeling, because we can just uh, implement partial fits and change the like, words representation a little bit. But also some visualizations to really truly understand what this topic is about, how this topic is generated, and what we can find in there. Together, these three advantages uh, give the control back to the developer. You can say, I want these models, I want them for these specific use cases. And because my stakeholder is not that familiar with machine learning, um, we have a bunch of visualizations that hopefully help them understand what we're doing here. Similarly, it allows for a lot of usability across use cases. And because we have these many variations of models that we can implement, what we can also say, I want outliers in there uh, because some things are simply not relevant. So let's do HDB scan. Or I want some hierarchical nature, uh, maybe a glomerative clustering in there, or whatever suits your use case. Who am I to say what kind of models you should be using? I have no idea uh, what models work best in all different use cases out there in all different domains. You, the developer, quite honestly, knows best um, when it comes to implementing all of these submodels and these variations and these use cases. And that's why I think a framework such as Bird Topic um, is very helpful to be using because it allows you, it gives you so many options to do all, all of these types of things. Thank you for listening. Um, this was a brief overview of Bird Topic. And the same philosophy and principles that you saw on the previous slide uh, applies to a certain extent also to other packages uh, that I've created that you can use like keyboard polyphos and concepts where the focus is on the developer who am i to say which string matching algorithm works best in your use case or which embedding model you want to be using for your keyword extraction that's up to you um, if there are any issues or problems that you find with any of these models please 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 let me know uh, put them in the issues in the discussions page or if it's, it's it's private data or you don't want to put it on a public forum that's okay uh, feel free to reach out with any questions on either my LinkedIn or Twitter, and I'll do my utmost best to, uh, to come back to you. Thank you.